Hello, and thank you all for coming. My name is Kirsten Turnbull, and my Keystone project is called Water and Crime in the American Southwest. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the global water crisis. Um, today, over 2.1 billion people do not have secure access to, to clean drinking water every day, and over 40% of the population of the world deals with issues related to water scarcity. Uh, if you take a look at this map that I have up here, produced by the National Intelligence Council, um, it's a projection of change in water stress by 2025. And you'll notice that there are no areas in this map that are highlighted light blue or turquoise, which would, inc which would indicate less stress, because this is an issue that is only going to get worse as time goes on. One of the many ways in which um, water stress can manifest itself is in global water conflicts, um, often dubbed water wars. Um, and two of the most recent examples of this are the Syrian civil war and the conflict in Israel and Palestine. In the Syrian civil war, uh, many experts actually believe that a major starting point was the 2006 drought that lasted through 2009 and caused a lot of agricultural workers to migrate to urban centers where they were understandably angry, unemployed, and displaced and actually became a large population of the uh, people who were recruited into the rebel groups that started the war. Additionally, throughout the war, um, different rebel groups and government agencies held control of different water supplies. So they would kind of hold the water hostage and that would result in increased violence. Similarly, in Israel and Palestine, the Israeli government controls all of the access for water for Palestinians. Um, these are both very complex issues, of course, and in such tense situations, the um, holding hostage of the water supplies only increases stress, and then this often results in violent conflicts. So um, having considered these global conflicts, I kind of thought to myself, today in the United States, are there communities in which lack of water access has exacerbated pre-existing tensions resulting in higher crime incidents? So can we see the same kind of phenomenon on a local level here in the US? Um, so when you think of issues related to water in the US, I don't know about you guys, but I think of the western part of the country. Um, there have been droughts on and off for decades, um, specifically in California and the rest of the, the uh, southwest. Um, so I thought, you know, where is their primary water source to begin with? And the answer to that is the Colorado River system. Uh, the Colorado River itself has its headwaters in north central Colorado in the Rocky Mountains, and it originally flowed over 1,400 miles into the Gulf of California. <laughs> Today, due to hundreds of projects that redirect the water because it is the main water supply for almost 40 million people, in addition to uh, climate change, which just makes water access or water in the river um, unpredictable, as well as the increasing population in the western part of the country, the river doesn't even come close to the, its original delta. It uh, runs completely dry over 80 miles from the ocean. Um, so if you look at this photo that I have up here, that's actually a tugboat that at one, uh, at one point would have been on the river. Um, it's about 50 miles from the Gulf of California. Um, as you can see, it is now uh, literally just sitting on dry land. So. Um, the state of Arizona itself, and I'm specifically talking about Apache County, which is this northeast county right here, um, are, is one of the many places that are completely dependent on the Colorado River as their main water supply. Um, I, for this project, am focused on Apache County because um, it is the, um, out of every county in the country, it has the most land dedicated to American Indian reservations. It partly encompasses Navajo Nation, the Fort Apache Indian Reservation, and the Zuni Indian Reservation. As a result, its population is nearly 70% American Indian. Additionally, um, nearly 40% of its population lives below the poverty line. So as a county that has large communities of color and large communities that are lower income, Apache County is more likely than other counties to other wealthier and more privileged counties to face the public health consequences of environmental crises like the global water crisis first. So having considered um, this additional context to my broader original question uh, with Apache County and the Colorado, Colorado River crisis, my original question <laughs> can be broken down into three more specific questions. The first of which being, how has the flow rate of the Colorado River changed over time? And so if you look at this plot, you can see in general, it has hovered around 12,000 cubic feet per second um, as an annual average with spikes around uh, 1986, 19, 1998, and uh, 2011. 
My next question would be, how has crime incidents in Apache County changed over time? Um, and as you can see, it's kind of increased in general with a spike around 2002, 2001, and um, a dip around 2008. And then my third question is, can the flow rate of the Colorado River be a predictor of crime incidents in Apache County? So can we associate these two things? And so to begin with, I started by look, um, looking at these interactive, uh, um, interactive maps that I created. And you can see here, um, you could, there's a drop down menu where you can pick the year um, from 1985 to 2014. There's Arizona and the Colorado River is that dark line there. And then below that, there's a <laughs> plot of how the um, river flow rate has changed over time. So if we want to look at a year that maybe crime, the crime rate in Apache County would be um, pretty low, you'd look at maybe 1998 because there was a higher flow rate of the river. So we'll look at 1998. And you can see that the county is highlighted pretty lightly. Um, and then if you hover over it, you can see it's about 3.7 crimes per 10,000 people. So it's pretty low. It, um, that kind of goes along with what we were thinking. And then if you want to look at a year that maybe the crime rate would be higher, you'd look maybe after there had been a, a higher flow rate and then it dropped really suddenly, maybe the result would be a higher uh, crime rate if what we were thinking is correct. So we're looking at 2001. And you can see already that it's a darker shade of blue, which indicates higher crime rate. Um, and it's actually 13.2 crimes per 10,000 people. So 3.7 to 13.2 crimes per 10,000 people seems like a pretty big increase. And maybe just based on this visualization, this could be a real association. So my next step was to create a linear model. Um, I wanted to see if uh, the river flow rate could be a good predictor. Um, so what does that mean? <laughs> a good predictor, um, based on the criteria that I'm considering here, um, has a high R squared value. So R squared value is the proportion of variation in your response variable, in this case, crime instance, that can be explained by your predictor variables, in this case, focusing on the river flow rate. <clears throat> So you want an R squared value close to one, a high proportion. Um, I was also looking at root mean square error. Uh, root mean square error is kind of an average measurement of how close your model is with its predictions to actual observed values. Um, so in a, uh, a basic understanding of this is that I split the data into um, two different sets. I built the model based on the first 24 years of data, and then I used that model to predict the next six years of data, and you can compare your actual um, predictions from the model to your observed uh, data that you'd, um, you know you saw. Um, <laughs> I also looked at an observed versus expected plot, which is what you can see down here. Um, and you want, it's a, it's a visual representation of the root mean square error. So you want a, as close to a one to one line as possible. And so here's my best model for prediction. Um, I, it, was kind of what we expected in that there uh, is a negative coefficient for Colorado River discharge, which means that as the uh, river flow rate goes up, crime instance go goes down. And this was an okay model for prediction. It had a fairly high adjusted R square value, a fairly low root mean square error, um, but it did have two coefficients that were not necessarily significant. Um, you may be noticing the square root of the crime incidents and the additional uh, years since 1984 co um, covariate, and those were included in order to account for underlying mathematical assumptions in the model. And so why does this matter? Um, whether or not there is a statistically significant association, it's really important that we consider these kind of secondary consequences to environmental crises that we haven't before. Um, a lot of the plans and, and solutions that have been considered uh, focus maybe on the um, more primary consequences, things like um, the fact that we need water to survive um, and we are going to die without it, but so many other issues are going to occur before we get to that point and we need to consider these things before, <laughs> before we, um, we start implementing solutions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I ran over time, so I can take one question. Okay. Yes, You're thank you. Oh. Your presentation. oh, you did it differently than I did. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I have five minutes for questions. What other factors did you consider that might be... Uh, <coughs> yeah. 
So this is really tricky. Um, I sped through that part. I'm sorry. I thought I had less time than I did. <laughs> um, but if we go back, um, so this model, when you have data that is has a time series component to it, like these data, um, the river discharge was measured annually and the crime instance was measured annually. Um, you have to account for the changes in the underlying mathematical assumptions that occur because of that time data, which means that you can only include other data in the model that is also measured annually. So unfortunately, <laughs> I could not include things like uh, per the percentage of the population that is of lower socioeconomic st economic status, which is something I would definitely have considered in um, a model where I, I could have included that data, because there isn't a measurement of lower sec socioeconomic status that's measured annually. Um, so I did only consider uh, the Colorado River discharge and the year since 1984. Um, and this was an exploratory project. Um, there wasn't really a precedent for it. So I think in that situation, it's kind of OK. But if you are moving forward, you would definitely have to take a look at other factors. Yeah. How did you control for other things that might be causing crime? Yeah, so that is kind of what I just explained. <laughs> so you, in this situation, it's really hard to do that because we don't have an annual measurement of a lot of the things that would cause crime in some place like Apache County. Um, so like there isn't an annual measurement of socioeconomic status. There isn't um, an annual measurement of a lot of other things that would maybe be causing crime. Mm. Mm -hmm. Is any kind of crime considered or was this? This was violent crime specifically, yeah. Yeah, Kyle. Um, did you see a, a trend in how flow of the Colorado River has changed over time? It's only, you said it was around 1,200 or so. 12,000 cubic feet, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So these measure measurements are at, measured at Lee's Ferry, Arizona, um, which is actually, if you look historically at the Colorado River Compact, um, which was decided in like the 1920s, it's where they decided to split up the, um, the upper and lower basins of the Colorado River system. Um, so they control how much water actually, there, there's like a minimum of how much water has to go through Lee's Ferry, Arizona, because the uh, southern part of the Colorado River system needs like a mandatory amount of water in order to provide all the water to like Southern California and Arizona and a lot of the other places that are dependent on it. So you can't really see it in that plot I showed, but if you look at other sites, there is a definite decrease. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you thinking about how the river water gets to human use? And in the back of my mind is the Flint water crisis, which has less to do with the Flint yeah. River and more to do. Definitely. Definitely, yeah. So it's interesting. Um, the, so the, if you look on the Apache County website, they do kind of cite the Colorado River as their main source of water. And it's, um, I forget which reservoir it actually is, but they do pull from a reservoir that's directly um, pulled from a, a dam on the Colorado River. But they also have a lot of information about their well system. And I did look at that data as well, but it was not, um, and that association was not there. And that could have been because there were not that many wells to begin with. Um, but it isn't solely the Colorado River that they depend on for their water source. Um, there's also wells, and they, um, they end up buying a lot of water, which is interesting. They had a similar situation to the Flint water crisis, actually, um, maybe five years ago, where <laughs> there was some kind of um, coal mine accident. Yeah, <laughs> you're not. <laughs> um, <laughs> where um, chemicals from the coal mine actually spilled into the river. And so if you like turned on a tap in the Navajo Nation part of Apache County, it was orange water. Um, so they, there are there are situations similar to Flint, um, and there are definitely other issues with even just like having plumbing and having <laughs> um, like modern resources that we kind of take for granted here in the Northeast. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>